heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. Caroline hides off today. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up on the program, Arm prepares for its IPO with a roadshow slated for next week. We'll discuss with our team and we also speak to Ross Gerber of Gerber Kawasaki. Plus, full earnings coverage ahead. Dell soars to a record high on a PC recovery while Broadcom slumps amid a disappointing forecast. We talk AI in earnings and Tesla revamps the Model 3 and slashes pricing for its premium vehicles in an all-out push to boost sales. We'll bring you those details, particularly out of China. First, a check on markets. All about that jobs data. Non-farm payrolls grew 187,000 in August. The estimate was 170,000. We opened in equity markets, particularly the technology sector, higher early in the Friday session, but we changed direction. The logic in the first instance was it signals the Fed would not raise interest rates further for the time being based on this data set. NASDAQ 100 soft to four tenths one percent. SOX Philadelphia Semiconductor Index lower two tenths one percent. Broadcom is a part of that story, which we'll cover later in the show. Yields have also changed direction. We're up eight basis points, nine basis points on the U.S. 10-year, 4.19, 4.2%. And Bitcoin holding at around 26,000 U.S. dollars per token. These are the individual stock movers in the tech sector that we're going to be covering in today's show. There are some individual stories within there. Tesla down now 4.6%, basically slashing prices on the high-end SNX, base model SNX in China. And then finally, this next gen Model 3 is now in China. We have the details of Bloomberg's done a whole. Dell is now up 22%. This is an astonishing reaction to a confusing story. We'll go to our reporter in New York to discuss their earnings in the context of AI and then Broadcom down 6%. Basically, they looked at the fiscal fourth quarter forecast. Uh, for sales of $9.27 billion. And the street's asking, hold on, you're telling us that AI is gaining traction for you. Why is that not reflected in your sales? Those are the movers of the currently publicly traded uh, companies. One future company that may end up in public markets, Arm. It's one of the most anticipated stock listings of the year. And now Arm's looking to set a date for its IPO, with a roadshow kicking off after the Labor Day holiday in the U.S. With the latest details, Bloomberg's Liana Blaker, who, who leads M&A coverage for us. OK, so I think we have a date for pricing and the roadshow. What do we know? So the date is going to be September 13th for the pricing of the IPO. That's the actual IPO, but trading isn't expected to start until the next day, which is September 14th. So this is right around the corner. And while Arm is aiming to list on those dates, it could always move. The timeline for IPOs is always uncertain, and it really depends on how meetings with investors go. Those meetings will start next week when the roadshow launches. The first signal of the roadshow launching will be early Tuesday. We're expecting a filing to come out for ARM to update its prospectus, and it'll publish for the first time a price range of where they'll be marketing shares. We, we talk on Bloomberg Technology about ARM as kind of the starting gun for a series of technology IPOs that we're anticipating, but also the size and scope of this is important. What are the numbers that we think in terms of money being raised and valuation? We reported yesterday for the first time that SoftBank is sort of scaling back how much they're going to raise. This isn't because of the prospect of the company. In fact, they're very bullish on the company. And Masayoshi Son, the SoftBank CEO, does not want to part with more than 10% of ARM, they own 100% of ARM. And originally the Vision Fund, which you might remember is that ambitious fund that lost a lot of money through the startup bets, they had owned a 25% stake in ARM. Recently, that stake was sold back to SoftBank. So because the Vision Fund is no longer a seller in this IPO, they were expected to be a seller, but they no longer are, SoftBank can hold on to more shares. So for that reason, ARM is going to raise potentially between five and seven billion, which is lower than the amount we originally published, which was eight to ten billion. So it's a bit complicated, but uh, the main point is that SoftBank is going to cash out here with a lot of proceeds, but not as much as we originally thought. It is complicated, but it is the one that we are watching in the world of technology. Bloomberg's Liana Baker giving us all of the latest details. And after this long weekend here in the U.S., 
we are waiting for some movement on arm. Right, joining us next, Ross Gerber, president, CEO and co-founder of Gerber Kawasaki. Uh, Ross, is, you and I were talking off camera in an astonishingly busy week. Um, I want to start on that jobs data, and we always frame it as such. Jobs, data, what will the Fed do, and how does that impact the technology sector? What's your reaction to the numbers this morning? Well, you know, I still, I've been saying this for so long, the Fed is done. I mean, all they're going to do is create more imbalances in our economy by really attacking just a few industries, because that's all rates do. And when you look at what's happening with housing in the banking sector and the risks of the Fed continuing to raise rates and, and the tremendous losses the Fed is now taking on its own portfolio that the taxpayers are paying, you know, it, it really doesn't make sense. All the numbers are trending in the right direction. We have completely restrictive rates right now. Businesses can't borrow. Individuals can't buy houses. They're having kids. They can't move up. You know, it, it's certainly affecting the economy. And many companies are done hiring. You know, they're just done hiring for now. And, and so we, we're seeing a very good environment if the Fed just lays off right here and lets things work itself out. Um, I think the next move is lower for the Fed next year. You know, Ross, the, the story of 2023 has been artificial intelligence driving this equity market higher. And there are specific names you and I will get into. But the Fed's always been there in the background. When you're assessing your, your investment priorities and investment thesis, which are you focused on more? the opportunity in AI or the impact of higher rates on valuations? Well, you've got two really competing forces here with rates being super attractive, like clients coming in to our firm. You know, it's very easy for me to make them five, six, seven, eight percent by buying bonds. And, and for many clients, that's the return they're shooting for. So it's kind of great if you're conservative and older. And we haven't seen rates like this in over 20 years. But on the other hand, the maximum return I see making on these bonds is, let's say, five, six, seven, eight percent, right? Where equities over the long term have averaged 10 percent a year in the S&P 500, where if we own the Nasdaq, small caps or things like my fund GK, which are really growth oriented and concentrated funds, we can expect much higher rates of return. So if the Fed's at the top of the rate raising cycle and we've already valued in this effect on you know, the market and valuations and the next really move for rates are to stay the same or lower, we expect, you know, earnings will drive the next move in markets. It's not going to be like a P.E. expansion. And I think that's what investors have to understand. For the market to move higher, earnings has to move higher. And same with individual securities as well. All right, Ross, let's go from the macro to the micro and have a bit of fun. I want to talk to you about NVIDIA. You've had a lot to yeah. say about that name. And in particular, its association or relevance to Tesla and a comparison between the two. Take it away. What's your thesis? So my thesis is that Tesla and autonomy was where NVIDIA and Tesla originally met. So Tesla used to use NVIDIA chips in building their autonomy systems in the Model S back in the day. And Tesla started making their own chips or designing their own chips because NVIDIA was like, we're not going to design GPUs specifically for Tesla. So Tesla's like, all right, we'll do it. So over the years, the two companies have, um, you know, really not competed, but continued to develop hardware and software for autonomy. And with that, many of the uh, NVIDIA GPUs were used in crypto and then cloud and now AI. So for the first time, we see a convergence of actual applications, which is generative AI, chat GPT, and then autonomy, full self-driving. And we have these applications and it's just driven this massive investment from all the major tech companies to upgrade their databases and their systems to being intelligent. And they have to buy NVIDIA chips to do this. So I think both companies represent the best of American innovation, technology, and opportunity over the next decade. So, boy, I, I'm super bullish on these two companies. They're, they're two of my top three holdings in my fund, GK. And, and I think investors, even though these valuations are very high, have to think out over the next five and 10 years what's really going to drive growth in our economy, and it's always been technology, and AI is a tremendous leap forward in technology. You know, if you think about specific technology or specific products, we've talked a lot about the H100 and A100 GPU series mm -hmm. this year for obvious reasons. They are the chip of choice uh, or, or the tensor core GPU of choice for AI. Less about Dojo and, and Tesla's right. own proprietary silicon. Do you still assign a lot of the potential for Tesla on that competence in silicon? 
Absolutely. And I think that's in the valuation of Tesla, because obviously if it was an EV maker, you look at Rivian, which is a great EV maker, its valuation is, you know, 5% of Tesla. So when you, when you think about why is Tesla such a valuable company, it's because of its technology. And that does center a lot around AI, Dojo chips, um, their really machine learning and ability to, to now train the cars through AI clusters. They just bought a huge NVIDIA, you know, H100 cluster of, of, of Really, they're not really chips. They're like these massive machines, actually, that you add into your database. So when you look yes. at a company like Salesforce, which had great numbers, and I use Salesforce at my company, and you start adding AI to this platform, it's going to be like a game changer for Salesforce and its users. So I think that there's so many companies in big tech that can benefit from this, and NVIDIA and ultimately Tesla are the roads to get, reaching these efficiencies through uh, AI and autonomy. Yeah, we talked this in the show this week about how Salesforce has pricing power as well, right? They could charge seventy five hundred per user. For we the spend AI so much. Yeah, we right. spend so much. Hey, on hey Ross, we're, we're, we're short on time, and I want to get to Disney and Charter because Disney's a name that you you hold and follow closely. What what do you make of that spat? Well, you know, I feel like being a Disney long term shareholder, you feel like you're getting kicked in the head over and over again. But this is really about why do I watch cable TV? I actually am a Spectrum user. I was about to tweet them and say, pay the damn fee, because the only reason I watch Spectrum is for sports. And so it's absurd that you're, you're cutting off sports from your you know, subs when cable's dying. And the only reason people watch cable is for sports, pretty much. So, you know, we're in this new period of time between linear TV and cable and this, you know, yes. convergence of streaming and this battle for who's paying for what and where. And, and it's just playing out. But in the end, Spectrum will pay because people only want to watch sports. You know, I mean, that's bottom line. That and Taylor Swift. Uh, Ross, you are a private investor in the entity known as X, formerly known as Twitter. I reported yesterday that specifically the biometric data policy update only applies to premium subscribers. It involves a government issued ID with a selfie or a, a double verification through picture. The response I got on the X platform was astonishing. What do you as an investor and user of X make of that, that privacy policy update? Well, you know, you can argue two sides of this coin with almost every decision X makes. You know, I think part of it is great. You know, like profiles should actually correspond to an actual human. And checking the current verification system, in my mind, doesn't really work. You know, it, it, it's kind of good, but not great. This is very similar to what the Bitcoin companies were doing when you were signing up, is you'd have to do the same thing and send a picture of yourself with your ID, and that would verify you for taxes and all this kind of stuff. So this isn't an uncommon thing for people in the digital world to do. I think for a social media platform and one that's building an AI platform, it's a little bit big brotherish and scary that now I'm trusting Elon with all my biometric data and I can totally get the pushback as well. So, you know, there's a plus and a minus to this thing. I don't, I don't know how quick I am to upload my driver's license yes. to Twitter you know, yet, uh, you know, so I, I get it, you know. So I, I think some of these things, it's really meant to make the purity of the platform better. But at the same respect, people aren't that excited to give away bi biometric data to Twitter either, you know, or X. Uh, Ross Gerber, president, CEO, and co-founder of Gerber Kawasaki. I think I threw a dozen different names and stories at you. Yeah. What a fast start to the show. Thank you very much. Much more ahead. This is Bloomberg Technology. President Biden speaking outside of the White House, responding to the August non-farm payroll number coming in at 187,000. The estimate was for 170,000. The president saying that the highest share of working age Americans are in the workforce under his presidency, that since he took office, uh, the economy has added a record number of jobs, 13.5 million jobs since he's taken office, and also reflecting that According to the president, incomes are at their highest level since prior to the pandemic, putting emphasis on the impact in the near term and in the long term that the Inflation Reduction Act will have on the economy, also emphasizing the role of the middle class under Bidenomics. Also, of course, mentioning uh, the job creation and support that electric vehicles will have in America's economy. Speaking of which, the big news as we go back to the technology sector overnight 
being Tesla. Tesla revamping the Model 3 sedan with sleeker looks and longer range while slashing prices of its premium vehicles in an all-out push to boost its own sales. For more, I'm delighted to be joined on set by Bloomberg's Dana Hull. Now, that refresh Model 3, we start there, but that's only in China and I think Europe. Not China. yet here in the U.S. Yeah, and what was funny was last night I kept like refreshing the Tesla, you know, web page to see if it was in the U.S. But no, it's just China and Europe, which makes sense. They retooled the China factory first. Okay, we've been waiting on that one. I think more of a surprise potentially was the continuing downward price of Model S and X, the most expensive of Tesla's offering. What do we know about that? So the S and X are really like a tiny share of Tesla's overall sales, but by slashing the prices, they now qualify for the $7,500 tax credit under the Inflation Reduction Act in this country, in the United States. So this is an all-out push by Elon to chase volume, which he forecast, you know, he, he telecast to everyone that that's what he was going to do. Yeah, we'll remind our audience. I think the line from Elon Musk has always been that they are willing to sacrifice profit to protect growth. Just explain that to us. Yeah, so so they are willing to sacrifice profit margins or gross margins to to maintain their market share, and and it's really put the other automakers sort of on the back heel because how do you compete with Tesla on price now? Uh, I think you and I quickly reflect on the kind of big breaking news of this week that we worked on together. That is. Uh, Federal prosecutors are looking into this procurement order we reported a year ago. Um, the, the subpoenas have been issued. You know, this is the latest twist and turn, but it centers around Omid Afshar. Just explain who Omid Afshar is and why we're we talking about him. So Omid is one of Elon's top lieutenants, and he's an interesting character in that he seems to work at all of Elon's companies. He right. appears to be working at X. He worked at Tesla for a long time. He was, he's really kind of the architect of Gigafactory Texas. He also, at one point, had a VP role at SpaceX. And yes. even though he's at the center of this probe, because he apparently ordered people at Tesla to order this special glass for, one, for a house that Elon was thinking of building, he is still employed, and you know where this federal probe is headed, headed is a big question. Yeah, we, we replied to, re reported, according to sources, that these subpoenas were issued, and one of the issues centered on communications to and from Omid Afshar and other Tesla executives, and we will continue to report on that. Bloomberg, Dana Hall, thank you very much. The other top story in the tech sector is Dell. Shares of Dell hitting a record high today after reporting better than expected sales of personal computers and data center hardware. It's fueling hopes of a recovery in the market for corporate technology. Who's with us? Who else? Bloomberg's Brody Ford out in New York. This is an astonishing share reaction, Brody. Let's start with it. Uh, what are sell siders at least saying yeah. about this? We hear that phrase, better than feared, and I cannot think of a better example than this. I mean, you know, sales are down 13%, but we thought it was going to be 18 So this is pretty good. So let's buy the stock, right? Uh, so, yeah, it's up 25%. And what we're really seeing here is that the demand for PCs, particularly business PCs, are stabilizing quicker than we thought, as well as getting a little uplift on the server business. Companies have this due to AI. Could be due to a better macro environment. We all want to tell an AI story, but that's part of it as well. So across the board, sales were just a little better than we expected. You know, we saw HP a couple of days ago saying that their recovery is going to take longer than we thought. And Dell really took the other side of the coin, which I think is surprising to a lot of folks as often the two results track each other pretty closely. Yes. It is not surprising that there is an AI discussion in the context of Dell. But, I, you know, what they said was this is a long-term tailwind. What is the AI story for Dell? What is it that Dell does that is relevant to, to artificial intelligence? We talk about cloud so much that we forget some big companies still use servers. They still need servers, and Dell sells them, and they sell them with a bunch of those nice NVIDIA GPUs in there, and they say, hey, you want to run some on-premise generative AI solutions? This is the one for you. And so they said that they have $2 billion in backlogged orders for a specific type of server, which is marketed to be good for AI. Um, so essentially, they say that long term, more AI workflows, more need for servers, more Dell winning. All right, Bloomberg's Brody Ford. Thank Busy you. week for you here on the show and with plenty of earnings. Thank you very much. The other big earnings story is in the chip sector. Investors were initially kind of underwhelmed with Broadcom's results out yesterday. Some analysts weighed in why that might be. Have a listen. It's not a bad result. I, I do think people were hoping for more just given all of the recent hype around AI. 
That was Stacey Razgon, Bernstein Senior Analyst on Bloomberg TV's The Close. Yesterday evening, let's turn to one of our internal experts on the chip sector, Bloomberg's Ian King. You and I talked a lot about Broadcom going into it, what the AI story would be. What was the AI story in the end? I mean, the, the AI story was as promised. The unfortunate thing, though, was the re how that reflected on the overall company. Basically, Hock Tan, the CEO, said, look, you know, all of our upside is coming from this large language model build out that we're seeing. Everything else kind of flat at best. He described it as a soft landing, but obviously the market took that as like the overall demand for semiconductors, not fantastic. Well, what I enjoyed talking to you about genuinely is, is the technology story, like understanding what each chip maker does in the AI supply chain. So explain Broadcom's offering in the data center context. Yeah, I mean, they have two big main plays here. The, the one is that they really dominate the market for what are called switches. These are chips that decide where the traffic goes, basically. One computer's got some information, needs to get to another. The switch chip is going to be what makes those incredibly fast decisions to send that data around, to switch it. The other play that they have, and that's a, quite a big play as well, is Google. We've heard about the TPUs, the, yes. their own in-house. Who makes them? Who designs them? Broadcom. The legacy of Broadcom, uh, well, an important part of this business is Apple, frankly. It yep. makes uh, short-distance communications, a.k.a. Wi-Fi and, and Bluetooth. Yeah. If AI is doing well, but sales growth is kind of low single digits, what does that tell us about the smartphone business? Yeah, I mean, Hawk made an interesting comment yesterday. He said, look, our wireless division is basically defying gravity. What he was meant by that was overall things are just not great. As we know, we've seen you know, the numbers. But demand is kind of OK for that division. They're going to see some growth into this quarter where, as, you know, as Mark Gurman has told us, we're going to see a new iPhone, we're going to see new products, and that will feature some Broadcom chips. But overall, not, not fantastic was the bottom line. All right, Bloomberg's Ian King, another very busy person this earnings season in the chip sector. Uh, let's move from what's happening in the public equity markets, the tech space, and move to one of our other favorite risk, asset, risk assets, which is Bitcoin. Joining us now to get the pulse on the VC crypto space, after all of the Bitcoin ETF decisions earlier this week, is Elise Killeen, Stillmark founder and managing partner. The firm has about $85 million in assets under management, but focuses on Bitcoin companies. So I guess... The news, which is not surprising, we discussed it 24 hours ago on this program, is the SEC kind of punting a decision on ETF applications for many names. But what have you made of everything that's happened in the last seven to 10 days? Well, BT BTC Bitcoin matures along two distinct but very closely related paths. That's Bitcoin the asset and then Bitcoin protocol and technologies, including Bitcoin's Lightning Network, its payment protocol. The grayscale victory over the SEC earlier this week is a significant advancement for the maturation and adoption of BTC, the asset, because it makes a spot ETF much more likely. Um, it also limited the arguments that the SEC can advance in the future in denying spot ETFs. And particularly what the court found um, to be challenging or problematic was the approval of future of a Bitcoin futures ETF, um, while the SEC continued to reject Bitcoin spot ETFs, with the argument, of course, that surveillance sharing agreements were um, insufficient, or that there was um, potential for the practice of manipulation in those markets. And so, what that means is that for the SEC to continue rejecting or denying a Bitcoin spot ETF they'll have to form a new argument and one yes. that would be distinct in its properties from future ETFs. And that no, moves I, up the timeline for which we expect to see a spot ETF. Uh, we, we, we consider the, the basics of why this is happening. You know, the argument from those that have filed applications is that the ETF would give retail and institutional uh, investors just an, an, a mechanism to have exposure. You are a VC that invests in Bitcoin companies. So, so how do you play this longer term story? Where do you invest to benefit in the longer run if uh, you know, a, a Bitcoin spot ETF does become authorized? Well, so the expectation that a spot ETF will become authorized 
um, exists in a sort of ecosystem of activity in which we see BTC the asset further financializing and maturing. And so we're investing there. An example of this is that we recently made an investment in a company called Meanwhile, which is the first company to offer a BTC denominated whole life insurance policy, which has the effect of further financializing Bitcoin as an asset. At the same time, there's advancement happening in Bitcoin payments technologies, including to facilitate the introduction of Bitcoin payment technologies lightning network specifically to match the needs of under other trends that we've seen in the tech field um, and in particular AI. I want to go there. You know, uh, the Bitcoin lightning network was something we discussed heavily, you know, not in 2023 or the end of 2022, but in prior years. Now, with all of the momentum in AI, how do you see AI putting momentum back into a focus on the underlying technology for Bitcoin? What's really exciting is that Bitcoin developed slowly and purposely. So Bitcoin technologies and Lightning Network in particular was developed to solve global scale problems. It wasn't developed to introduce a quick trend um, or to service um, speculative behavior or gambling, but really it was meant to serve as a payment infrastructure that was secure and scalable. And this is what AI needs. So we know as AI has become commercialized and we're seeing products like ChatGPT and others flourish and become popular, that fraud and payments and chargebacks have become a problem for those companies, which curtails our addressable market. And one of the advantages of Bitcoin's Lightning Network as a payment solution is that settlement is instant. So if you're instantly transmitting value or a product, you can instantly settle that transaction and mitigate um, or completely assuage the risk of chargebacks um, and that sort of fraud. And in addition to that, because Lightning Network was purpose-built, it scales without the constraints of the underlying blockchain, which means that activity in the underlying Bitcoin blockchain doesn't curtail the amount of transactions per second that are possible on the Lightning Network. And for AI, that's absolutely necessary. You need to hit scale of millions of transactions per second or more in order to service the needs of AI companies. And Lightning Network can uniquely do that. Elise Colleen, Stillmark founder and managing partner. You know, we really appreciate the explanation of how you play this as a VC, but such a firm grasp on the underlying technology as well. Thank you. Have a good long, long weekend. All right, coming up here on Bloomberg Technology, we'll look at the latest health tech trends with founders fund partner Delian uh, Asparuhov and Sword Health CEO V. Bentu. That's coming up. Uh, we're also seeing some breaking news crossing the Bloomberg terminal. Uh, the New York Times reporting that Meta the parent company of Facebook may allow Facebook and Instagram users in the European Union, the EU, to pay to avoid advertising, to avoid ads. That coming from the New York Times, it did briefly push the shares higher. They've been negative, pushed it into positive territory as those headlines broke. We are now flat as a pancake on meta platforms this Friday. This is Bloomberg Technology. Okay, on today's VC Spotlight, we're taking a look at the latest trends in health tech investments. And for this, let's bring in Virgilio V. Bentu, founder and CEO of Sword Health, along with Founders Fund partner and Varda Space Industries president, Delian Asparov. Uh, v, I'll start with you. This is really interesting. The, the technology that you are trying to grow and commercialize is sensor and software approach to pain management. Just explain Sword to us, uh, broadly speaking. Okay, so basically we believe that if you have physical pain, right, if you have low back pain, as an example, and the best solution uh, to your problem, it's not pills, it's not painkillers, it's not surgeries or injections, it should be high quality, high intensity physical therapy, right? That's the solution. The problem with that is that the way we deliver physical therapy, it's still 100% labor intensive which really limits and, uh, and, and is a bottleneck in terms of access to care. 
And so what we've done was we developed this AI solution that we call our digital therapist that basically replicates uh, what the human physical therapist will do in a PT clinic, but then you can do your sessions independently at home at 7 a.m. in your pajamas after breakfast with our digital therapist, right? With our AI solution. And then everything that you do is remotely supervised by a member of our clinical team. And so we have this human plus AI model um, to how we are changing how we treat physical pain, yes. which is the biggest problem in healthcare. Uh, v, this is an interesting case study because we have one of your biggest biggest investors with us as well. So Delian, you know, why why did Sword fit within your investment thesis when you consider how to play health tech? Yeah, we were originally uh, thinking about this as an investment thesis at my prior firm, uh, Coastal Ventures. Uh, back in summer of 2018, we were analyzing the general healthcare landscape and surprisingly stumbled across the fact that musculoskeletal care, generally what you think of as physical therapy, but can have you know a wide range of everything from you know neck, lower back, knee surgery, et cetera, and the care after that, was the largest spend in healthcare, and it was one of the areas where there was very limited you know sort of applications of technology. For sure, you had individual tools that you'd see in brick and mortar physical therapy clinics but there wasn't really much technology being applied to the actual like delivery of that care. There had been a first handful of attempts. They were doing this very thin technological layer. Think of it as effectively, you know, interface on top of Zoom, but no real technology that was showing an improved sort of, uh, you know, clinical outcome. And when we met, uh, you know, Virgilio and his team in late 2018, there were two things that really stood out to us. One, they had true scientific proof of their clinical methodology being more effective than going to a brick and mortar clinic. Everybody else was trying to replicate brick and mortar. They were actually improving it. And this paper was published in Nature, so a very preeminent scientific journal. And and then two, the actual solution was not just basically put physical therapists behind a Zoom screen. It instead was this AI combined with sensor technology that allowed you to, while you're watching your evening TV, actually be doing your yes. you know, knee surgery therapy, your lower back therapy, which just makes it more convenient and actually significantly improves the clinical outcomes than having to go in person to a clinic. V, I want to know what it's like you know, growing the business, commercializing. In your latest round, I think at the end of 2021, November 2021, you got a $2 billion valuation, big jump in valuation, and then you had a lot of momentum. So what does that look like? Explain how you've grown. So the, the reason why we are still going very, very fast uh, since 2021, in spite of these uh, economic challenges that everyone is facing, is because one of our uh, key value propositions is that we drive cost efficiencies. Uh, if you are a large employer in the U.S., right now and you want to drive um, financial uh, efficiency, of course, you can reduce up your headcount. That's one way to do it. But in terms of healthcare, it's not like you can deny a surgery to one of your employees, right? You are still on the hook for that. And so what we allow you to do is that instead of a surgery for your low back pain, as an example, you can use SWORD and we are able to treat the patient much more efficiently with higher levels yes. of patient experience. And of course, really, really reducing costs. And the way we tie all of this up is that we contractually guarantee to our clients that we save them money. So then it becomes a no-brainer why they should uh, adopt SWOT. Yes. Adelian, quick final to you. You know, one consideration when you, you invest in a healthcare startup is its exposure or risk with the US healthcare system, insurance, where it fits in with how the system works. Just explain quickly how you thought about that. Yeah, I think in this particular situation, because it's such a large bucket of spend, you can actually go after individual self-insured employers, right? Think of like the Fortune 500s, the Walmarts of the world. Internally, they have super sophisticated medical teams. When you're talking about hundreds of thousands, millions of employees, they may as well be their own individual healthcare network. And so relative to SWORD's early commercialization in Europe and Australia, where they had to send to sell to national healthcare systems, in the United States, you can chip off basically individual employers one at a time that are very both clinically focused so they'll appreciate the nature papers that Virgilia is publishing and very cost conscientious relative to somebody that's writing a Medicare plan Walmart ultimately is delivering their bottom line every single quarter to public investors rather than being funded by you know public dollars and so the combination of the two led sort to go from effectively having no US commercialization effectively at the end of 2019 to now being over a hundred million dollar revenue run rate largely based in the United States Fascinating global conversation. Virgilio V. Bentu, founder and CEO of Sword Health, founders fund partner, Delian Asparov. Thank you both 
This is Bloomberg Technology. Okay, so for most artificial intelligence companies, adding dot AI is a pretty important part of indicating that you are a player in that field. However, dot AI just happens to be the internet country code for the Caribbean island of Anguilla. And that is bringing in tens of millions of dollars for that island. Beautiful. Joining me now on set, Bloomberg's Rachel Metz. This is a crazy story. So there are AI companies all over the world cutting checks to this tiny little island. Yes, in, in, in a manner of speaking, yes. So Anguilla's uh, country code top level domain, that's the two letters at the very end, um, dot AI. A lot of different countries and territories, well, all, pretty much all different countries and territories have these two letters that were assigned to them decades ago, um, back in the 90s, as uh, the internet was first getting its uh, legs, so to speak. Um, Anguilla has had this for a long time. Uh, at a certain point, um, I think it was around 2009, they opened .ai domain registration up to people outside of the country. Um, so it could be people who didn't live there or have a business there. Um, and it is, the revenue from that has risen steadily. Um, but this past year, once ChatGPT was released, it took off like a hockey stick. You have been speaking to some of the officials in this tiny island nation who are dealing with this. What, what, what are the numbers? What's life like with, for them? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, so the person that I spoke to, um, his name is Vince Kate. Um, he actually moved from the U.S. to Anguilla in the 90s um, and not to be in charge of the domain registration, but sort of happened to land in that spot. Um, so basically, when people register .ai domains with companies like Namecheap or GoDaddy, um, money goes from those companies to um, this man, Vince Kate. Yeah. And he sends it on to the Anguilla government. So he's been watching this. He has a front seat to all this. He thinks that um, the country is going, sorry, the territory is going to see 25 to perhaps $30 million in revenue this year, which is Astonishing. huge. Uh, Bloomberg's Rachel Metz. Check out her story on Bloomberg.com. That does it, sadly, for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Recap on our podcast. It has been a massive week for earnings, for AI, and everything in between. From San Francisco, this is Bloomberg Technology.